Hi everyone and welcome to Microbiology and Parasitology course. Today I'm going to give you the first topic of Introduction to Microbiology by the instructor Dr. Lakanagan Hayua Winfield. The first topic I'm going to introduce you about the world of microbe. Microorganisms or microbes are microscopic organisms that exist as unicellular, multicellular, or cell clusters. Microbes are usually too small to be seen with the, with the unaid eye. They evolved long before the first plants and animals appeared and affect our lives in more ways than we might expect. Microbes are wide space in nature and are beneficial to life but some can cause serious harm. They can be divided into six major types, which are bacteria, archaea, algae, fungi, viruses, and protozoa. However, less than 1% of them are known microorganisms that, uh, that are known to cause disease to human and any other living organism. If we would like to look at them, we will need an instrument called microscope. A microscope is a laboratory instrument that is used to magnify objects that are too small to be seen by the naked eye. Mostly, compound microscope are, are sorry, compound microscope are being used in the normal laboratory, which consists of at least two lenses. When we use this compound microscope, we can look at some creature that is big enough, like from one milli, sorry, one millimeter uh, to even like nanometer in length. For example, we can see the tick, like the small insect from the animal, the worm egg, all the red blood cell, chloroplast from the plants, bacteria, and even a very small bacteria like chlamydia. However, if we, if we would like to look for something very small like viruses, we cannot use this type of microscope. Some microscopes can uh, even be used to observe an object at the cellular level. Allowing scientists to see the shape of the cell, its nucleus, mitochondria, and other organelles, which is called um, electron microscope. Here is the anatomy of the microscope, which you will be learned in the practical class. I'm going to introduce you some important part of the microscope. For example, the mechanical stage, which you have to put your slide on, condenser, uh, the light source, switch, baits, fine and cause adjustment knobs, and also the uh, stage control and uh, objective lens, and also the ocular lens or eyepiece lens as well. And I'm going to teach you how to use microscope in the laboratory for. So let's move on to the world of microbe again. Microbe can be found in many places, such as on our hands, in the air or in the soil. Interestingly, some microscopes can grow and reproduce in habitats where no other organisms can survive. They can be found in hot springs and deep underground veins of water, in volcanic rock beneath the ocean floor, in extremely salty water in the Great Salt Lake and the Dead Sea, and even below the ice of the Antarctica. Here are some examples of the habitats of the bacteria that I'm going to introduce to you. Most of the micro, uh, microorganisms can be found in terrestrial habitat, like from soil or from the aquatic microbial habitats, like from fresh water or salt water in the ocean or in the sea like this. Uh, even some, micro, some microbes can be seen in, our, in other organisms, like in plants, like when you see from the leaf of the plants, you can see like kind of spot on the leaves or even in our body, animal or human like, like us. We have some uh, several type like millions of microorganisms living in our body or even on our skin, or even though in the extreme environment like hot spring water 
or around the deep sea vents or in the vo volcanic um, vents under the ocean, this uh, microorganism can leave, for example, the archaea bacteria. And in some theory, they say that some microorganism can be living outside the space. They are so-called the extraterrestrials, uh, sorry, extraterrestrial, terrestrial micro, microbial habitats. Uh, we can uh, say that they probably from other planets or outside the, the world, or if we get it from the outside, they can just like travel with the asteroid or something and then come to the earth. Next, I'm going to introduce you about the vital role of the microbe. Microbe are a very important organism uh, that related to many organisms in this world. Uh, they have so many roles that I can conclude in this slide. For example, the main role of them is as the decomposer because they can recycle nutrients. Uh, some of the microorganisms, for example, the algae or cyanobacteria, they can produce oxygen and make the air breathable. Some of the microorganisms can be used as a source of new drugs like uh, uh, antibiotics or under other type of drugs. And even though some of the microbes can be used as food, for example, for making yogurt in the process of fermentation, cheese, wine, and beer. And some of bacteria that live inside our body, especially in the gut, they can help us digest food and they can also be used to clean up hazardous chemical uh, contaminated in the ground or water. And they can also support, support and protect crops, making, making the crop grow uh, quicker or faster or increasing the yield. And however, these are some benefits, uh, benefit of the micro, but however, some of them can cause a very bad effect on humans and environment. For example, some of them can make food spoilage. Like we can see mold or like spoilage or, spoilage or rotten food that caused by the microorganism. And in, in this uh, course, I'm going to focus on the microorganism that cause disease in human. As I, uh, as I have introduced you from the first slide, that there are so many types of microbes. Uh, for this slide, I'm going to group them into two main groups, which are cellular microorganism and a cellular. For cellular microorganism, they can be divided into prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And for a cellular is the virus is the virus. For a prokaryotes, um, the example of these microbes are the bacteria and archaea. They are prokaryotes, which pro means before and karyote means nucleus. They are single cells or unicellular with a circular DNA genome that floats around in the cytoplasm. Many pro prokaryotes have one or more smaller circle of DNA called plasmid that can carry additional genes. Bacteria and archaea have a very similar cell structure. They do not have a nucleus or membrane bound organisms. Some prokaryotes have a tail like structure like flatula which they use to swim through liquid or fimbri, which enable them to stick to the surfaces. For eukaryotes, the eukaryotes include protists, fungi, uh, algae, protozoa, helminth, plants, and other animals. The defining feature of a eukaryotic cell is that it has a nucleus. So for eukaryotic, U means true and karyote means nucleus, in which the linear DNA genome is packaged into one or multiple chromosomes. Eukaryotic cells also contain multiple membrane bound organisms, including mitochondria, that are not found in prokaryotic cells. And the last group is the acellular uh, type of, of uh, uh, I'm not going to say is the microorganism, even though the virus are non-cellular entity, 
Uh, they consist of a nucleic acid core like DNA or RNA, which is surrounded by a protein code. Although, as I said, that viruses are classified as a microorganism, they are actually not considered living organisms. Viruses cannot reproduce outside the whole cell and cannot uh, metabolize on their own. Viruses often infest prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, causing diseases. Now, let's look at each microorganism in more detail. The first one is the bacteria. Bacteria are unicellular organisms. The cells are described as the prokaryotic because they lack a nucleus. They exist in four major shapes, like bacillus or rod shape, coccus or spherical shape, spirilla or spiral shape, and vibrio or curved shape. Most bacteria have a peptidoglycan cell wall. They divide by binary fission and they may possess the factula for motility. The difference in their cell wall structure is a major feature used in classifying this organism. According to the way their cell wall uh, structure stains, bacteria can be classified as either gram-positive or gram-negative when using the gram staining. Bacteria can be further divided based, uh, divided based on their response to gases oxygen into the following groups, for example, Arabic, uh, which is living in the presence of oxygen, and Arabic bacteria, which is living without oxygen, and facultative anaerobes, which can live in both environments. So according to the way they obtain energy, bacteria are classified as heterotropes or autotropes. Autotropes make their own food by using the energy of sunlight or chemical reactions, in which case they are called chemoautotropes. Heterotropes obtain their energy by consuming other organisms. Bacteria that use decaying life forms as a source of energy are so-called desaprophytes. Mm -hmm. And here are some examples of the structure or shape of the bacteria that we can find in the lab. And in the laboratory, I'm going to uh, teach you how to do the gram stain of the bacteria to uh, study the structure and morphology of the bacteria. The next one is archaea. Archaea or archaea bacteria differ from true bacteria in their cell wall structure and lack peptidoglycans. They are prokaryotic cells with vitality, sorry, with avidity to extreme environmental conditions. Archaeans use different energy sources like hydrogen gas, and carbon dioxide, and sulfur. Some of them use sunlight to make energy, but not the same way to plants. They absorb sunlight using their membrane pigment. This reacts with light, leading to the formation of the energy molecule uh, of the ATP. So in conclusion, this kind of organism, they are mostly found in the extreme environment. For example, here are the example of some archaeans that can live in the deep ocean, hydrothermal vents under the uh, ocean. And the environment, I mean, temperature around them is up to uh, 98 degrees Celsius. Uh, and the example of this organism is uh, in this picture. And some bacteria, they can live in the environment without the oxygen, which is called an anaerobic condition. For example, uh, the archaean that living in the rumen of the animal. And in some archaea, they can live in a very high salt concentration, like for this, uh, for this example. Next microorganism is fungi. Fungi are eukaryotic cells with a true nucleus. Most fungi are multicellular, such as mushrooms and molds, and their cell wall is composed of chitin. Atopos, such as uh, crabs, lobster, or shrimp and insect, use chitin to form their exoskeleton 
So you can think of how tough a beetle is, and you can see how this polymer provides structural support to the fungal cells as well. While some fungi assist at a, a single cell, such as yeast, they obtain nutrients by absorbing organic material from their environment as a decomposers through uh, symbiotic relationships with plants like uh, symbionts or harmful relationship with the host like a parasites. Uh, they form characteristic uh, filamentous tubes called hyphae that help absorb material. The collection of hyphae is called mycelium. So fungi reproduce by releasing spores. Here are some examples of the fungi. And these are the picture of yeast, Saccharomyces cerisii, which is a budding yeast that we can use to ferment uh, like food for us to make wine, bread or beer. And these are mushroom. And these are mold, which you might be familiar with like when they grow on the bread or some on the rotten food or making food spoilage. And these are the candida albicans, which is the fungi that live in our body. The next uh, microbes is algae. Uh, actually in this course, we are not going to teach you about the algae because it's more like a kind of environmental aspect, but I'm just going to uh, make you used to this organism by giving a brief introduction. Algae are so-called cyanobacteria or blue-green algae are unicellular or multicellular eukaryotes. They obtain nourishment by photosynthesis. They live in water, damp soil, and rocks, and produce oxygen and carb carbohydrates used by other organisms. It is believed that cyanobacteria are the origins of Greenland plants. The next microorganism is the viruses. Viruses are the smallest of all the microbes. Their genome is made of either DNA or RNA, but not both. And this is packaged inside a protein shell called capsid. They are not made of cells, so they are a cellular cannot make their own proteins and don't grow. Instead, they must infect a host cell and hijack its machinery to assemble new viruses. Viruses are usually only able to infect a limited number of species living organisms. Like for example, bacteriophages are the viruses that infect bacteria and um, microvirus are the viruses that infect fungi. Some viruses have a lipid envelope which they steal from the membranes in the whole cell. An example of an enveloped virus that you will be familiar with is the influenza virus, which cause influenza or the flu. And another famous example is the SARS-CoV-2, responsible for the current COVID-19 pandemic. Here are the example of some virus. As you can see, this is the virus particle, which is packed. Uh, what is packed inside is its genome, which is, can be DNA or RNA. Here are the capsid protein and envelope. And you can see this guy, they look like quite like uh, the virus with the head, the body and tail. This is called bacterial virus, which is the virus that infects the bacteria. And this is the tobacco mosaic virus, which is the virus that can be found in plants. And this is the HIV, which is, the, you can see this, this particle is budding from the surface of the white blood cell of the host. And the last microorganism is the protists or protozoa. Protozoa are the unicellular Arabic eukaryotes. They have a nucleus, complex organelles, and obtain nourishment by absorption or ingestion through specialized structures. They make up the largest group of organisms in the world in terms of numbers, biomass, and diversity. Their cell walls are made of the cellulose. Protozoa have been traditionally, uh, traditionally divided based on their mode of locomotion or um, movement or mobility 
refractory motility. For example, factulates, uh, protozoa produce their own food and use their whip-like structure to propel forward. Ciliates uh, protozoa have a tiny hair that beat to produce movement. Amoeboids have false feet, false feet or pseudopodia used for feeding and locomotion. And sporosaur are non-motile. They also have different means of nutrient, nutrition with group stem as an autotroph or heterotroph. Uh, here are some examples of the protozoa. You might be familiar with the paramecium, uh, which is an organism that is the single cell organism living in the freshwater habitat. And it is covered in a cilia, which is a short hair-like structure used for swimming and for wafting food into its groove like mouth, which is in the center. And this is the picture of amoeba. And they are also living in the fresh water like as a single celled microbe and feed on bacteria or small protozoa. They use pseudopodia to engulf their food and for locomotion. And this is another type of protozoa which is called uh, Trypanosoma, sorry, trypanosoma, which is uh, causing the African sleeping signets. And here are some examples of uh, unicellular protozoa like Gaidia, Trichomonads, uh, Lishmania. And the last one is the helminths or the multicellular animal parasites. A group of eukaryotic organisms consisting of the flat worms and round worms, which are collectively referred to as the helminths. Although they are not microorganisms by definition, since they are large enough to be easily seen with the naked eye, they live as part of their life cycle in microscopic form. Since the parasitic helminths are of clinical importance, they are often discussed along with other group of microbes. And those are the type of microbes that I would like you to know about. And the last topic is about the highlight in the history of microbiology. Um, actually, microbiology had a long and rich history initially centered in the causes of infectious diseases, but now including practical application of the science, many individuals have made significant contributions to the development of microbiology. And here are some of the most significant discoveries in the history of microbiology. In the early history of microbiology in 1970s, um, that you can see that uh, there is the observation of the little animals by a Dutch man named Anthony van Leeuwenhoek. He is a Dutch man and he, sorry, and he has uh, observed uh, something under the microscopic by using the microscope that he has built. And he called this uh, thing that he see, sorry, he saw under the microscope as the animacus. And what he have seen is uh, actually he is a, um, a lens maker probably. And he applied his knowledge to make like this type of uh, simple microscope. Uh, which is this the lane and the holder and something to adjust and focus the thing. And actually the size of the thing that he's made is very tiny like this. In 1973, Leeuwenhoek began writing letter, letter to a newly formed Royal Society of London, describing what he had seen with his microscopes. His first letter contained some observation on the sting of the bees and 
less later, he has discovered the bacteria, free living and parasitic, parasit sorry, parasitic microscope protist, sperm cell, blood cell, microscopic nematodes, and also rotifer and much more. Well, and after his death in seven, in 1723, uh, he revealed the microscopic world to scientists of the day and is regarded as one of the first to provide accurate description of all organisms like protozoa, fungi, and bacteria. And later in 19, sorry, in 1796, there was the first discovery of vaccination by Edward Jenner. He spent his whole career as a country doctor in his native country of uh, Gloucestershire in the west of England. In the 18th century before Jenner, smallpox was a killer disease. The majority of its victims were infants and young children. So the inoculation with the related cowpox virus to build immunity against the deadly uh, of the smallpox by inculating his own son with the cowpox blister from milkmaids. And in 1980, as a result of Jenner's discovery, the World Health Assembly official declared the world and its peoples free from endemic smallpox. The next century is the fermentation and germ theory of disease by Louis Pasteur in 1862. He was a French chemist and microbiologist renowned for his discovery of the principles of vaccination, microbial fermentation and pasteurization. Uh, he worked in the Midland and he performed numerous experiments to discover why wine and dairy products become sour, and he found that bacteria were to blame. Pasteur called attention to the importance of microorganisms in everyday life and stirred scientists to think that if bacteria could make the wine sick, then perhaps they could cause human illness. So his medical discovery provide direct support for the germ theory of disease and its application in clinic, uh, clinical medicine. And he's best known to the general public for his invention of the technique of treating milk and wine to stop bacteria contamination, which is called a process of uh, pasteurization. His uh, famous experiments is so-called a spontaneous generation. Pasteur had to disprove spontaneous generation to sustain his theory, and he therefore divides, sorry, devised a series of swan necked flats filled with broth. He left the flat of the broth open to the air, but the flat had a curve in the neck so that microorganism would fall into the neck not on the broth. The flowers did not become contaminated as he predicted they would not. And plasters, sorry, and past and pasture experiment put to rest the notion of spontaneous generation. His work also encouraged the belief that microorganisms were in the air and could and could cause disease. Pasture postulated the germ theory of disease which states that microorganisms are the cause of infectious disease. Then Pasteur attempt to prove the germ theory was unsuccessful. However, the German scientist Robert Koch provided the proof by culture, uh, cultivating anthrax bacteria apart from any other type of organism. He then injected pure culture of the bacilli into mice and show that the bacilli uh, invariably cause anthrax. And the procedure used by Koch came to be known as Koch's postulates. They provided a set of principle whereby other microorganisms could be related to other disease. And after his invention of the Koch postulates, 
He also known for his role in defining the specific causative agent of the tuberculosis, uh, cholera, and also anthrax. And he also able to grow bacteria in the peer culture using agar. And we can see the colony of the bacteria, which is made from billions of identical cells of the bacteria on the agar. I had into I have mentioned about the germ theory of the COC4. Sorry, I have just introduced you about the germ theory by COC, uh, which is called the COC4 postulate. Um, this theory can be explained uh, like in this picture. Uh, for the first step is when the organism. The organism must always be present in every case of the disease. And when uh, organism must be isolated from a host containing the disease and grow in pure culture. So he has uh, done the experiment onto the mice and then isolate the organism from the dead animal and then culture it onto the agar. And then the microorganism are grown in the pure culture. And then he look under the microscope and he's uh, made a hypothesis that uh, the, the microorganism should be identified and should be identical to the first animal that uh, got the disease. Then samples of organism taken from pure culture must cause the same disease when inoculated into the healthy susceptible animal in the laboratory. An organism must be isolated from the inoculated animal and must be identified as the same original organism first isolated from the originally diseased host. Uh, so the, for conclusion, you can look from this photo. Uh, after we get the pure culture of the disease and we inject this onto another mice, uh, this mice must, must die from uh, and having the same symptom. And when we isolate the culture, again, we should get the same organism and should be identical to the original uh, organism that caused the death of the first animal. Uh, after that uh, important discovery from Koch, uh, the development of the microbiology has been moved to uh, a variety of drug discovery. Like for example, the emerge, uh, actually there are the emerge of the golden age of microorganism during which many agents of different infectious were identified. And many of the agent of microbial disease were discovered during the period, which leading to the ability to stop uh, epidemics by interrupting the spread of microorganism. Uh, despite the advance in microbiology, it was rarely possible to render life-saving therapy to an infected patient. Then after the World War II, uh, the antibiotic were introduced to medicine. The incidence of pneumonia, tuberculosis, and meningitis, syphilis, and many other diseases declines with the use of of antibiotic. And the first person who discovered the first antibiotics is, uh, was Alexander Fleming. He was a Scottish biologist, pharmacologist, and botanist. And he observed that the fungus called uh, Penicillium notatum made an antibiotic on his agar. Uh, he did the experiment by uh, growing the bacteria caused the phylococcus on the plate and accidentally uh, the penilium spore uh, fell onto the agar and grow into the mold colony. And he found the zone of inhibition uh, that stopped the growth of the bacteria around here. Uh, from that time, he uh, know that there are some compounds that produced by the mold, which is called the penicillin that killed the Staphylococcus aureus. And then penicillin was tested clinically and mass produced. And he also based known on the discovery of the enzyme lysozyme, which are the with are the in which is the enzyme that can uh, inhibit the growth of the 
bacteria as well.